Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, I'm Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. I remember lying in bed on a Sunday morning and realizing that I was a hypocrite. My niece Marsha, she says she loves reading, which is why we bought her the entire Harry Potter, the Percy Jackson and the Kane Chronicles. It took her ages to go through the Harry Potter series. And then finally she made it to the last book. And of this moment, she's been stalled on the first book of the Percy Jackson series. If I ask her, have you been reading, she always nods happily, but she's barely progressing further than 10 or 15 pages. And this is in the last month or two. So it bugs me, because I know that reading isn't just about reading, it's about spelling, it's about structure, storytelling, and imagination. As you'd expect, I'd nudge Marsha at every chance I got, encouraging her to read but she still gives me this happy smile, and she makes little or no progress. Until that Sunday morning, I didn't think the lesson applied to me. I'm one of those crazy people. I go for a walk, and sometimes I'll listen to music, or we'll speak to each other. Renuka, my wife, and I will speak to each other along the way. Even so, I'll get at least between an hour or two hours of audio every week. I'll read before I go to bed, and while I'm making breakfast, I'll probably watch a TED talk. Marsha's situation clearly did not apply to me, so why did I feel like a hypocrite? It just so happened that on that Sunday morning I was browsing through my Kindle collection, and as I scrolled through the books I realized that I hadn't read at least 30% of what I'd bought. And some of them I'd started to read and then abandoned them halfway. And that got me thinking, how is this different from what Marsha is doing? How is it different from what all of us are doing? We start out with good intentions. We buy stuff, we save stuff onto our computers, we save it onto our devices. We know that future reading, whatever we're going to read in the future, is important. And suddenly it seems to be too overwhelming. We're reading through one book when you get a recommendation to read five others. You're leafing through one article and a stack of 1,000 articles seem to be trying to get through your doorway. I don't like the feeling of being a hypocrite, so I devised a system. And since I like naming systems, I called it TBM, the bare minimum. It even sounded nice when written on a piece of paper, or better still on a car plate. In my crazy mind, I read it as TBM, which is the bum. The kind of guy who is lazy and won't do much more than needed just to get by. This mindset of doing the bare minimum, well, I thought it was my own invention. And yet, it's not. Many years ago, financial advisor Dave Ramsey talked about his own minimum method, and he talked about it with respect to paying back loans. Now, when you have several loans to pay, what advice do financial planners give you? They tell you, you should pay the biggest loan back first, which means that if you have loans of $500, $2,000, and $200,000, it makes a lot of sense to whittle down the biggest loan, because that loan has the biggest amount of interest. Ramsey doesn't think so. He works on a seemingly counterintuitive method. He gets you to pay the smallest loan first. He calls it the debt snowball method. And here's how it works. You start paying off your debts from the smallest to the largest. And of course, you're getting momentum as each balance is paid off. And there's a psychological reason behind this. If the task is too big, it's very easy to give up. 
After all, if you pay $100 on a $200,000 loan, that's like nothing. But if you put that $100 towards the $500 loan, then you wiped away a chunky 20%. Today's episode is not about achieving any big goals. Instead, it's about chipping away small wins. It's important because we all seem to fall by the wayside when it comes to long-term goals. So what are the three things that we will cover today? The three things that we cover are what is the bare minimum and why it's not a mind trick to do even more. The second thing is how do you use triggers to get the bare minimum going? And finally, why you need to use it exclusively for long-term projects. So let's start with the first one, which is what is the bare minimum? and why it's not a mind trick to do even more stuff. Almost every one of us has seen a progress bar on our computer, haven't we? It's that little bar that goes from left to right telling us that a program is opening or a file is being saved. What many of us might not know is that the progress bar doesn't give you the real situation because let's face it, we're impatient. To counter this impatience, then-student Brad A. Myers decided that the progress bar made computer users less anxious, and so it made them more efficient and possibly helped them relax at work. Now, he wanted to prove this, so he had a test with 48 of his fellow students, and they used the computer with the progress bars and without the progress bars. 86% of them said that they liked the bars. They loved knowing that progress was being made. So Brad A. Myers told them, this bar is not accurate. It's not an accurate representation of what's happening within the computer. But they didn't care. They still preferred the progress bar to having nothing at all. So let's play that again. They preferred the progress bar to not having anything at all. When we look at the tasks that lie before us, the stuff that we have to complete, we often see nothing at all. We haven't started on the job because we know there's a lot involved. The very thought of getting to the end point seems to overwhelm us immediately. And we're not talking about learning a complicated program or writing a book. We're referring to something as simple as reading a book. We look at the book knowing fully well that we'd like to read it, but nothing happens. And one book piles up on another until we have books and ebooks that we like to read, but we can't get started. Or if we get started, a distraction comes along and we chase down that butterfly like distraction right away. When I first started out in marketing, I didn't have many butterflies to chase. Back in the year 2000, almost all marketing was done offline. So you'd sit there and there would be this knock on the door and there would be this big package in the mail. Well, it was by courier actually. And what we had were pages, lots of pages. And they would talk about some program that would help you become more successful or some marketing thing that would help you with strategy, with your tactics. And there was nothing else to see. Unlike today, where you can easily find two dozen courses and programs just in your inbox, there was nothing. There was just one package back in 2000. You paid a small fortune for that program because all of them seemed to be in the range of $1,500 to $5,000. And then you got these three ring binders, your cassette tapes, and of course later we got CDs, and that was that. You didn't see any butterflies. You didn't have to chase anything down you didn't have to invest in any butterfly net. Today, you and I have this sea of stuff that we can download in minutes and we can buy in seconds. And that's only part of the problem. Then you have to learn and then you have to implement. So why not borrow a concept from the credit card companies? Let's say you have $5,000 to pay on your credit card. Logically speaking, you should be getting MasterCard or Visa to deduct that amount directly from your account. But the credit card companies, they seem like Santa Claus. They say, don't worry, just pay $125 on your credit card 
and everything's good. You and I know that's not a good strategy. We should not be paying off the minimum amount. We should be paying it off in full. But you can pay off the minimum amount. And insidious as it might seem, it's the perfect way for getting things done. So it's insidious in the credit card world, but in the goal setting world, it's perfect. So let's say there's a book that you haven't read and you go back and you say, what's the bare minimum? And let's say the bare minimum is one paragraph. So do one paragraph. And immediately it sounds ridiculous. You're not going to get very far with one paragraph, are you? Well, there's this story about John Grisham, the famous author. And he says, if I had 30 minutes to an hour, I would sneak up to the old law library. I would hide behind the law books and I'd write that book, the first book that made him successful, that made him famous, which is A Time to Kill. And what he did was he wrote that book 30 minutes at a time, or sometimes for an hour at a time. That was his minimum. But a thousand days later, that first book was done. Now, if Grisham weren't famous and he hadn't sold, I don't know, 250 million books, we might have never heard that story. But now we know. We know that his entire career was built on 30-minute increments. And yet for us, 30 minutes might seem like a lot. My friend Campbell Such and I had a mini tussle over this concept of meditation. I happily boast that you need at least 30 minutes of meditation to get any kind of momentum. For the first 20 minutes or so, it seems like you're swatting flies. So many thoughts going through your head. But as you get to the 30-minute mark, things start to happen. They start to calm down a bit. But Campbell disagrees. He spends 5 to 10 minutes every morning meditating. That's all I can manage, he says. And he's right. I disagreed with him. I disagreed with him at the point of that discussion. I thought that 10 minutes was barely a warm-up. And that if a person couldn't do 20 minutes or 30 minutes, it's better to avoid it altogether. And this is the flaw with a lot of productivity plans when you think about it. They seem to suggest that you can fool your brain. That if you go for a walk, you should put on your shoes and then you'll end up going for 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And the concept of the bare minimum is entirely the opposite. It's pure sloth behavior. It's not asking you to fool your brain at all. It's saying, do the bare minimum, just like those credit card companies ask of you. Do nothing but the bare minimum. No mind tricks, no additional time, no extra effort. Just the smallest possible thing that you can take on, that's all you should do. So I decided to take my own advice. I tried this method for my website. In July 2015, I started on the revamp of our website. Now, I'm super fussy, but even with that fussiness, I did outsource the website. I got quotes, I got designs, and they were all terrible. So I decided to do the task myself, and I got the coding done by stresslessweb.com. That was in July 2015. We're now in July 2017. Well, we're not in July. We're in September 2017. Every chance I got, I thought about the website, but nothing happened. I decided I'm going to do the bare minimum. What can I do in 15 or 20 minutes? Some days I just get three or four testimonials up on the website. Some days I just make a list. I wouldn't even do anything with the website. And the next day, maybe I do a headline, a first paragraph. And I didn't get momentum. What I got was progress. I'd want to do a little more, but most days I just resisted like crazy. I just spent 15, 20 minutes doing the stuff. And that's also because I have a lot of other long-term projects. I paint every day in my moleskin diary. And somehow, even though I enjoy that, that too was falling apart. So I decided, okay, here too I'm going to do the bare minimum. 
right after breakfast, I'm going to just do a sketch. Or maybe later in the day, I'll do a wash or something like that. It almost seems tedious because you think, well, this is so little. We're not going anywhere. But as you'd suspect, the painting is getting done. The website's getting done. Just one paragraph, two paragraphs at a time, and the progress bar is completing itself. The bare minimum might not seem like much, but we all need to push psychological boulders. When faced with the task of taking a walk for 30 minutes or writing a book or doing any long-term project, it seems like we're never going to get anything done. But think of your progress like the progress bar. You might just get 2% of your work done and the progress bar in your brain feels like it's 100%. You follow up the next day and again, it's another 100%. It may make absolutely no logical sense, but this isn't about addition or logic. It's about the satisfaction of not just getting something done, but getting 100% of that something done. It's tiny, that something, but you don't care. The goal isn't to take the second step. It's to take the step you need and then stop right there. No fancy motivation, no momentum, just one step. My niece, Marsha, doesn't need to go through the Percy Jackson series. She needs to go through one paragraph or two paragraphs. That's it. Campbell Such doesn't need 30 minutes of meditation. If five minutes is all he has, that's all he needs to do. The bare minimum, that's all we need. And it's amazing how much slow progress we can make. However, there's still a problem with planning. If we want to get these activities going, we have to do something, don't we? We should be setting something in our calendars, getting something done, and no, you don't do any of that. This is where triggers come into play. Instead of fancy alarms that you merely ignore, how about aligning your bare minimum to a trigger? A trigger that shows up every day. Let's find out how. Let's go to the second part and find out exactly how to do it. In many Western countries, Christmas brings carols, chaos, and carrots. Carrots? Yes, carrots. Carrots for Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen and Comet and Cupid and Donner and Blitzen and Rudolph. So they have carrots and they have the milk and cookies for Santa. Now that tradition seemed to have originated in the 1930s when the U.S. was in the middle of the Great Depression. Parents tried to teach their kids that it was important to give to others and also to show gratitude for the gifts that they had received. But how do we remember that we have to put out the milk and the cookies and the carrots? It's Christmas Eve, of course. It's the trigger. It's the trigger that requires no alarm, no reminder. And that's because alarms and reminders don't work very well. You know how it works, right? You put a reminder on your phone and then the reminder pops up and you swipe it away. If it's email, you're likely to jump right into reading it, possibly even answering it, but any reminder to do a task gets this look of disdain. The way around the system is to have no alarm at all. Instead, you do something when something else happens. So for instance, I paint right after breakfast. No matter what time I have breakfast, I will sit down for about five or 10 minutes, and then I will sketch or paint. Renuka, on the other hand, sketches every time she drops her mother off for Tai Chi. So for both of us to sketch or paint, there is this trigger. And after that trigger, it's not a long process. It's just five or ten minutes of whatever we want to do. It's the same thing when we go for a walk. When we go for a walk, we talk until we hit the first set of traffic lights. And that's when we know, oh, traffic lights. We have to put our headphones on. Now, sometimes we will go past the traffic lights for a while and then we'll put the headphones on, we'll listen to audiobooks, we'll listen to podcasts, but the traffic lights become the trigger point. There's no alarm going off. D. 
This system of triggers is important because we rarely keep to a fixed plan. No one ever has breakfast at the very same minute. And hence, if your breakfast is early or it's late, it's easy for you to ignore the alarm. When an activity like breakfast is in itself a trigger, then you know what comes shortly after. Now we can make a mistake when we're putting these triggers together. We can say, okay, we've got all of these five, six, seven long-term projects going, so let's put all of them together. But I would suggest you have fewer, maybe two or three. For instance, I know that the website project won't last forever. I know that in a month or two, I should be able to fix that, get that done. I know that the EPUB project where I'm learning about EPUB, in a month or two, that'll be done. My painting, however, started out in 2010. It still goes on. It'll go on for the longest time. So some long-term projects will come and go and the others will be needed to be done every single day. To make a habit, you need to choose just one or two, or maybe three things that you can do in that day. Five minutes each and you've only spent 15 minutes of activity doing those three things. And even the busiest person in the world has 15 minutes to spare. Over time, some of these things become so part of your nature that you don't even think about them. You don't have them on a to-do list. Take brushing your teeth, for example. When was the last time you needed an alarm to trigger that activity? I now wake up to the sound of a meditation chant. So I wake up with the meditation chant, and then I meditate. That's the trigger. That's part of what happens every day. So it's not even part of my list anymore. However, when you're starting out just setting up one trigger and the bare minimum time that you can spend on that task, that's what you have to get down. And then you get going. But there's one little caveat. All of these bare minimums are not meant for urgent or important tasks. They all need to be used only for long-term projects. Let's find out in the third section why that is the case. We all know the story of the tortoise and the hare, don't we? They both set off on a race and the tortoise is slow, taking step by step. As the story goes, the hare falls asleep and then the tortoise wins the race. The story might sound remarkably like a bare minimum tale, and in a way it is, but it's important to note that there is a point of difference as well. It's a big point of difference. A race is not a long-term project. It's a reasonably finite project in the sense that there is an endpoint. There is like a deadline at the end. You have to get to that endpoint very quickly. And when we have a deadline, we get to that deadline. We might be a little slow to get to the deadline, but we get to the deadline. But when there's no deadline, we tend to drop things. A lot of these long-term projects, they're not driven by money. They're not driven by fame. They're not driven by customers. They're just driven by your own need to do something, to achieve something. So I'm learning Spanish. There's no purpose specifically to learn Spanish. The painting, that's just the record of my life. All of these things are for my own happiness and all the things that you tend to do are for your own happiness. So you might join a dance class or a cartooning course and then you find that you give up somewhere along the way. The photographs that you plan to put in that photo book, that doesn't get done either. We are very good at prioritizing what's important to us. Things that are revenue driven, client driven, they have fixed deadlines, they can't wait. And so they get done. Things that are often essential to our soul, that gets tossed into the corner. It's sad, isn't it? We feel that sadness. We feel the pain of taking a course that feeds our soul and then we find that we've either abandoned the course or having finished it, we don't get the joy of continuing that skill. It's the same thing with books that we haven't read, documentaries that we would love to watch. However, sometimes even the work-related projects, like my website, it ends up in the same to-do pile. Why? Because 
the other website's working, so why bother? There is no deadline. But doing the bare minimum keeps the project going. At all times, however, the bare minimum should ideally be reserved for long-term projects. We all know that if you do the bare minimum on a deadline-based project, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. But if the project isn't something that has a line in the sand and probably goes on forever, it's best to simply plod along step by step. It's the journey of a thousand miles. But it's not about taking steps. The bare minimum is just about taking one step. And then you're done for the day. When you have to take just one step, there is no overwhelm. The rest of the world can drive themselves crazy. But you're like Marsha. You're just reading two paragraphs at a time. Or like me, you're just building the website 20 minutes at a time. You can achieve a lot with taking a single step per day. That's TBM. It's the bare minimum. The tiniest bit. That's what you have to do. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. So what did we cover? We cover three things. The first thing is what is the bare minimum and why it's not a mind trick to get even more done. And in that we saw that the bare minimum is literally one step, 20 minutes, two paragraphs, just that. It's not a trick. It's not, okay, you start jogging for five minutes, then you feel good about it, then you go for 30 minutes. No, no, you just do five minutes. It seems counterintuitive. Try it. It works really well. The second thing is the factor of triggers. We all have alarms. We all have these things that pop in on our screen and they remind us of what we have to do and almost invariably we're swiping them away. They are set with good intentions, but there we go, swiping them away, hoping that tomorrow will be different, but tomorrow we're not going to be different. And therefore, the trigger can't be something that's set by technology. It needs to be set by something like breakfast or a traffic light, or when something happens, then your something happens. Your activity starts after that, just for five or ten minutes. And that's how you can go about things. Find the trigger, one, two, or three triggers. Because essentially, you've got to do two or three things a day. Five minutes or ten minutes of that something, get on with the rest of the day. And that brings us to the third part, which is reserve this bare minimum for your long-term projects. For your short-term projects, for your deadline-based projects, this is disaster if you're trying to do this. But you already know that. Even so, I'm telling you that... The long-term projects, the things that feed your soul, the drawing stuff, the dancing, the photography, the books, all that stuff, that feeds your soul. That's the stuff that you don't do. That walk on the beach that you keep telling yourself, yeah, we'll get there. We'll get to the beach. We'll get to the movies. No, it doesn't work that way. We have to do something and we have to do it now because there is no future. The future is now. And so what we have to do is treat it like a long-term project and then just do the bare minimum. With Marsha, we started out maths and she did this program, iXL. It's an online maths program. And Renuka gives her a fixed time to tackle that section of iXL. So she'll say something like, okay, you've got five minutes and then you're done. And so Marsha goes about her task. So in four years, she has completed over 15,000 problems. And she's gone from struggling in maths to being among the top students in her class. That's the power of the bare minimum. And that brings us to the end of the fifth out of six reruns. I hope you're enjoying these reruns because they have really good information. And you don't always remember the stuff that you heard several months ago. In fact, the other day I was watching this series called The Code on Netflix. It's about mathematics and numbers and very interesting from the BBC And you should watch it if you can. It's very, very interesting. That's C-O-D-E, code. Anyway, this is the third time that I'm going through it. And I turned to Renuka and said, 
I don't remember this bit at all. And it's almost like it drops off from your memory. So going back and listening to stuff again or reading stuff again, it's not only a memory jog kind of thing, but it also, you've changed since then. You've changed so much. And what seemed more difficult or hard to understand or hard to implement or even too bothersome to implement at that point in time then becomes very interesting right now. So that's kind of where the reruns come from. But what's happening in Psychotactics Land is what this section is about. And mid-July, we're having this psychology of starting up and I've been going on and on about it. But really, a lot of it is what goes on in our heads about this imposter syndrome, about having new ideas. You don't need to have new ideas, by the way. The boring ideas are better. Anyway, a large part of this stuff, six part series, that's what's covered in the psychology of starting up. And a lot of people have been asking for this for almost 10 years, and we've only just put it together. It's fresh, it's new, it's really cool. You'll find that it's also quite affordable. So we'll give you the details. Yes, still keeping you on tenterhooks, but mid-July, that's when it's coming out. It'll be in the newsletter. So make sure that you get your newsletter at least around mid-July. If you want to wait till August, then on the 2nd of August, we have the info products course. Now, a lot of info products are just information. And even this book or this course is badly named because this is not about information. Anybody can put information together. And the reason why a lot of us don't get to the end of a book or a course is because the information is not put together in a manner that entices the reader or the client to keep going. And then when they're done with that, they come back. When you look at psychotactics, for instance, we've done barely any joint ventures in the last 20 years. We don't do any advertising. We don't do any publicity. We have a much smaller audience. We've been flying below the radar. Most people don't know of us. How does this all work? How does it still sustain a business? for 20 years in a row? And the answer is, when clients come back. So what do they come back for? They come back not for more information. They're sick of information. What they come back is for information that's put together in a way that they can implement. And that's really what the information course is all about. So go to psychotactics.com slash info goodies, read some of the stuff, implement it, and then if you like, get the course. And as always, no matter whether you do a course or you want to grow your business or do whatever you want to do, there's always 5000 BC. So come to 5000BC.com, read the sales page, judge for yourself, and you'll find that it's a really good place. You might put it off for a while. You might have already put it off for a while. Some people put it off for five years and seven years. And then when they get in, they go, why did I wait so long? If you're one of those people, 5000 BC is for you. If you have any questions, email me. That's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye for now. Bye-bye.